to John chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 10 to 13. I, I think I, I gave Linda a typo. I gave her the wrong verses on the bulletin. It's John 1, 10 to 13 is what I meant to, to communicate. As we're thinking about these, uh, these aspects of the birth and early childhood of Jesus Christ, we looked on the, on the 14th that it was preceded by his eternal fellowship with God. We, we considered last week that it was prophesied in the Old Testament when we looked at those Old Testament prophecies, told you the, the staggering likelihood <laughs> or unlikelihood that one person would even accomplish eight of the prophecies and told you there's 330 to 350 prophecies that Jesus has fulfilled or is fulfilling and will fulfill by the, by the time of the end of the age. Today I want us to look at this, this idea that his birth and early childhood was met with varying responses. Met with varying responses. If you have your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1, look at verses 10 to 13. We have them, I think, on the screens for you. Just follow along as, as I read this, if you would, please. And stand with me, if you would, as well. So. We just read this together a while ago. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. We just read together. I've been reading all month now. What is this now? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. When you discuss the deity of Jesus Christ, there probably is not a better passage to start with than this chapter 1, verses 1 to 18 in John's Gospel. I pray that, that we've met it again in fresh ways in these recent days. Thank you. Be seated. Remind you of what J.I. Packer said in a quote I found from him. It is here in the thing that happened at the first Christmas that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. The Word became flesh. God became man. The Divine Son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. And I, was, I would add to that that if, if, the, if the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of God in flesh, does not stagger you, then I would, I would submit you haven't been thinking about it enough recently. And I would encourage you to think about it more and all that it means. The song we just sang, Fully God, Fully Man. Those, those amazing mysteries that encompass the coming of Jesus. It's, it's a wonderful event. And, and, and we read it sometimes through the lenses of being Christians and wonder how would any think otherwise. Yet historically we know that they've been varying responses. And we'll bring it up to the present day. Even today there are varying responses. I want us to think about two extremes. One, the first thing is that some responded what I call wickedly. Here in verse 10 11 it says, He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. It's not, it's not talking about the the inanimate world or even the animal kingdom. It's not saying that the animals didn't recognize their creator. What it's saying is that the one who made the world, who holds the whole world in his hands, when he came in the form of a baby in Bethlehem and began to grow and was announced in different ways, the typical response was they didn't know him. You say, well, you would expect that from non-Jews. What, what do the Gentiles know after all? I mean, they didn't have all the inside 
tracks that the Jews had, the covenants, the law, the, the promises, the miracles, the, 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 the presence of God with the Jews throughout their wanderings. Verse 11, though, silences that. He came to his own. The idea there is his own people, the Jewish people. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The overwhelming response by the Jews to their Messiah, who, if it, was a, if it was a conscientious Jew, he would say to you, I am looking for Messiah. I am longing for Messiah to come. The overwhelming response was a non-reception, a rejection. You understand today, there, there is this appearance, and it's a false appearance of a, of a middle ground to the gospel. There is no middle ground to the gospel. There is a response that brings joy and grace and peace, and there is a response that sometimes may look like a non-response, but it is a rejection. Every time there is a non-response to Jesus, it is a rejection of him. Because you do not receive him. The one I want to focus on today in terms of this wicked response, and you probably anticipated this, is Herod's response. Herod was a Jew. He was placed in the role of king. Now, we understand politically he was something of a puppet king because because. Judaism was under the thumb of the Roman Empire. But even in that context, Herod, in his kingly role, had some powers. Look with me at Matthew chapter 2. I just want us to look down through verses 1 to 18. We'll, we'll hone in on the last verses of this passage. But this is the story. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men or magi from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Isn't it interesting? The troubling. Wouldn't you like to have read, And Jerusalem was hopeful. That's not what we're told. Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him was troubled. There was a great concern. It's kind of that, kind of that love-hate deal that you long for Messiah to come and you long for Messiah to come and someone says, Messiah has come and you go, well, I wonder if that's true. And If it is true, what does that mean for me? I, I, just parenthetically, I would say, I think that's where a lot of folks are concerned. Revival. We long for revival. We long for revival. We pray for revival. And yet we know deep down that when revival comes, our schedules will go out the window. <laughs> and we will, we will be riveted to God's calendar. Read about revivals sometimes. The First Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards. How everything was turned upside down in that. There's this troubling that comes. And so Herod assembled in verse 4, assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Basically Herod had the Sanhedrin come uh, into the Oval Office, into the West Wing, said I want to talk with you. And I would like to think that they're not like evangelicals today, but I've watched it in the past where, where people just begin to, to drool at the prospect of being in the presence of power. And so they come. And he said, now tell me, what's your understanding of where the Messiah is to be born? Verse 5, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The word Bethlehem, you probably remember when you break it down, Bethlehem is house of bread. Be very appropriate that the bread of life would be born in Bethlehem. Prophesied to be so. 
Then Herod, Herod summoned the wise men. Now he brings in the, the magi, these, these stargazers, these, these astronomer types who studied the stars and understood, tried to make sense out of uh, their worldview by the movement of stars. They had been, they'd been uh, captivated by this one particular star which seemed to outshine all the stars and they followed after it. And, and just want to say a word about the chronology real quickly here. In all likelihood, when, by the time the Magi make it, Jesus is a, is a toddler. He's a, probably two years old. Uh, he's not the babe in the manger. So, and I don't want to upset some of you because you have nativity sets that have, that have camels and kings that, that don't get upset about that. I'm just saying that, that that's probably in the chronology. Otherwise, why would, when, when Herod understood what they said, why would he kill every baby two years old and younger? He goes to the outside limit. So he summons these magi. And he ascertained from them the time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And going into the house, there's a different place now. This is not a, this is not a cave where animals are housed and fed. They went into the house where the child was. They rejoiced. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So, so they have, it's really interesting, their dreams, very much like what we're hearing from the mission field today, where Muslims are having dreams. And these, in these dreams, they're told, go ask these people about Jesus. Go ask these people to tell you more about Jesus. These folks are warned in a dream that Herod is not interested in worshiping the child. He's not interested in, in seeding power, laying his crown at the foot of the child. He has evil intentions and so they went another way. And when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And so Joseph did as he was told. He rose, took the child and his mother, and by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Another prophecy fulfilled. Then Herod, this is what I want you to see here. When he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that, had, that he had ascertained from the wise men. What he learned from the wise men, what he learned from the, from the scribes, and the Sanhedrin, he puts into action a plan of execution to exterminate any boy child two years old and younger. The prophet Jeremiah had said something about such an incident. Verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. The birth of Jesus thoroughly intimidated Herod and people like him. I would simply say that the presence of Jesus and his followers today still intimidates. Whether you're in the Middle East where ISIS is on the move and if you've not seen the video I've mentioned it to you if you've not seen the video interview of the uh, uh, 
of the, the vicar or the bishop of Baghdad from the Anglican church sharing the horrible story where he comes to tears talking about these young people all under 15 years of age he said they cut their heads off and he weeps how do you respond to that you see even today and, and what these ISIS terrorists are saying is deny Jesus and confess that that Allah is God and Mohammed is his prophet still going on today much weeping the Yazidis uh, the Nazarenes there in that portion of Iraq according to this Anglican vicar a quarter of a million people a quarter of a million Christians have been driven out of that region or slaughtered one of the two I read an article of on the 24th that for the first time in 1970 years the bells would not ring in Mosul on Christmas Eve for the first time so there still is today that kind of hatred but brothers and sisters there's hatred in our own country for Jesus I read an article yesterday about four Christians in New Jersey who went to a park, a public park, were sharing the gospel. One was preaching. And they were arrested. The policeman said, you're on private property, which is fascinating to me because a public park is for the public. But he said, it's, it's owned by the city. And Christians cannot do anything here without a permit. I'm not saying that with any, any sense of alarm. I'm simply telling you, let's not be naive. There is a growing hatred in this country for Jesus and anything relating to Jesus. But you see, it must be. Because Jesus has no equals. He will never be content to be one among several. He is Jesus. The Son of God. The only way to God. And so the response of Herod, which we seem, we would say, oh my goodness, how, how barbarous that was. Is the same response taking place in many portions of the Middle East and basically basically anywhere that that Orthodox Islam holds its grip but before we throw stones at Islam we must take a look at America and realize that a nation founded on freedom Freedom of religion, freedom of expression is now a nation where some of those freedoms are being lost. So we too need to prepare. Not only for non-responses, not only for agitated responses, but we need to prepare for wicked responses to our declaration that Jesus is the reason for the season and truly if you know anything about him, he is the reason for every season. The seasons turn by his hand. He is crucified and risen and ascended and ruling and reigning and returning. Some responded wickedly. Bless God, some responded joyfully. Look at these episodes. We'll just, we'll just touch on them and hopefully whet your appetite today. Verse 12 and 13 says, but to all who did receive him. In other words, it wasn't a total rejection. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. 
Folks, there are no, there are no grandchildren in the body of Christ. When a, when, when, when a grandchild of mine confesses faith in Jesus Christ, while he or she is still in that biological relationship, my grandchild, he or she also becomes my brother or my sister in Christ. There's only children of God. There's only children born of the gospel. And some did. Think about the shepherd's response, first of all, in Luke 2, 8 to 20, if you want to turn there and look at that. Again, more of this story that we read around this time of year says that in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. What a different attitude. Let us go and see. The Lord has shown us something. Let us, let us go pursue it. Let's run it down and check it out. Oh, oh that our children would all do that. Oh, that our grandchildren, oh, that our kinsmen would... would we've shown you, we've told you, we've, we've taught you, we've, we've sung it to you, we've read it to you, we've, we've prayed about its entrance into your heart that you would simply go and see and check it out. Verse 16, they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Another mark, another mark of the reception of the gospel, the reception of the, of the name, believing in the name of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do. In their case, who he would grow up to be. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. What? Can it be? You see, some heard it, like Herod, and thought, we've got to stop this. This cannot be. It would manifest itself later on when they heard that he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and the, and the religious leaders would say, we've got to put a stop to this. We need to kill him and Lazarus. But no, not the shepherds. They told it. Mary, we're told, treasured all these things in her heart, pondering them. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Joyful response. See, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no yawning response to the Savior. When you believe in the name of Jesus, there is joy. What's tragic is when we when we grow chronologically and we seem to outgrow, we grow beyond the joy. Oh, Lord, I don't want that to happen to me. The joyful response, but not only the shepherds, think about Simeon. Simeon's an encouragement to me. He's an older man. He's at the end of life, and he knows it in Luke 2, 21 to 35. says, at the end of the eight days, when... When he, that is Jesus, was circumcised, he was called Jesus. He was given the name then, for he shall save his people from their sins. Remember, that's what the angel told Joseph. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens a womb, Jesus is a firstborn male to Mary, shall be called holy to the Lord, that is, sanctified, set apart, dedicated, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they go to make this sacrifice of the first male given to the family. And they ceremonially give him to the Lord. Now there was in Jerusalem a man whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Brothers and sisters, what a, wouldn't that be wonderful to be said of us? <laughs> What's he doing? 
Oh, he's waiting. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the manifestation. For us, for us it's not waiting for the, for the coming of Messiah. For us, it's waiting for the return of the Messiah. Why do you glow such? Why is there such a, such a hopeful beam upon your face? Because I am waiting for the return of my Savior. And He is coming as surely as I draw breath. Oh, that that would be our countenance. He was waiting. The Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow. What a promise. Simeon, how long do you think you're going to live? I don't know how I'm going to, I'm going to live. I'll tell you what, I'm going to die gloriously. <laughs> what do you mean? The Lord has told me. Now think about how the people responded to this. The Lord has told me I'm not going to die until I've seen the Messiah. And he came in the spirit into the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arm and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Whew. I'd love to have been there for that. May I hold the baby? Sure. You see, I don't think Mary and Joseph didn't know this. They're just following the ceremonial law. <laughs> and she's already got a lot to ponder in her heart from what the shepherds said. And so she hands this child to this older gentleman here. And he just, oh Lord, now I can die. You've let me see your salvation. Salvation for the Gentiles and salvation for the Jews. <laughs> and he hands him back. His father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to them, To Mary, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed she's pondering she's taking in what she's heard this child his growing up will cause many to fall his growing up will cause many to rise and Pharisees and kings fell and fishermen and harlots were raised up. A sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. What will happen to this child, dear mother, will be, as you observe it, like a sword thrust in the very center of your being so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And boy, did he do that. That's a whole other sermon in itself, just to go through the Gospels and places where people are thinking among themselves. And he says, why do you think among yourselves? And he lays their thoughts bare. Whispering among themselves where only they could hear. Why do you say among yourselves? And he lays it bare. But oh, the rejoicing of this one man, Simeon. But there's one more I want to share with you before we go. Anna's response. Luke 2, 36 to 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. Having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, 
worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. What a godly woman. Apparently her husband had died seven years after their marriage. And she simply devoted her life to the worship and meditation of God. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Get this picture here. Simeon's just handed the baby back to Mary and Joseph and they're holding him and Joseph's contemplating. He's now pondering and, and Mary's pondering and, and then Simeon speaks those direct words to her and now she's trembling and, and Anna comes up and says, are you, are you looking for the redemption of Israel, you over there? Here he is. Here he is. The redemption of Israel is in your midst. Now, brothers and sisters, that, that took faith to believe that of that baby held by this lowly couple. But you know something? It takes faith today to believe Jesus was actually born historically because there's a lot of people out there. If our children go off to college, I, I, you can mark it down. They're going to encounter somebody in the seat of, quote, higher learning that's going to tell them that the life of Jesus is a myth. Anna is one of those people, bless her heart, who's believing God. And, and believing God in such a, such a close intimacy with God that, that her, he opens her eyes to things that hardly anyone else sees. Most of the people in the temple that day saw a baby being dedicated. Two people saw the Savior. You here who've trusted in Jesus Christ, you've seen the Savior. Yet you've encountered people probably this past week. All they see is a baby. Maybe they wonder about, did he, did he really grow up and not sin? I mean, after all, <laughs> that's hard. And, and die? Why would, God, why would God let his son die if he's really the son of God? And come out of the grave? Who does that, for crying out loud? You've encountered some people this last week, or we'll encounter them this week, who are, just, who are right there. Well, what's my role? <laughs> Believe with joy. Because see, the things that these other folks believe don't bring them joy. The things that they don't believe don't bring them joy. They're miserable. And we won't convince them with our words. But it's fascinating to me that in, in, the, in the cultures of the dark, deep recesses, David Sitton said, you don't argue apologetics and ontology and teleology and all those great arguments. You don't argue the people who are in the darkest regions of Papua New Guinea and places like that. You don't argue them and over, overrule their arguments. You show them power greater than the power that they know anything about. And they follow power. Well, folks, it's, it's not so much power in our culture, in our, quote, enlightened culture. But you know what it is? It's joy. Joy. People pay attention to joy. They notice real joy. They know when it's put on. But real joy, real happiness, people notice that. And that, I believe, is the attitude. My prayer is as we go forward into 2015, rejoicing in what God has done in 2014, and even in the midst of some, of some real difficult providences, and we see the, the other, the victories and the, and the movements forward that God has taken us. We move into 2015 rejoicing with exceeding great joy, with something of that, that spirit of the angels who made haste, who went rejoicing telling people. That spirit of Simeon that says, I'm not afraid of dying. The Lord told me I'd be alive till I saw the Messiah. I just saw the Messiah. I'm ready to go. Just that, that spirit 
of how Jesus gives us peace for the end. That spirit of, of Annas, are you looking? You're looking for redemption? You're looking for hope? Here he is. Here he is. The hope of the world. Jesus. And it's on our faces that he's the hope of the world. He's our, he's our hope. He's the blessed hope. Coming again. Yes. So I'll close with this. His birth and early childhood, as well as his growing up into adulthood, his, his, his ministry, his mission, his, his being murdered on the tree, his rising from the grave, his ascending on high, has all been met with varying responses. That really, when we leave here today, first of all, how have I responded? To not respond is to be in the, in the rejection camp. But if I've responded, is my response reflected by joy even what we might call a joy in the midst of heaviness is that what people will know about me is that what will draw them is that what will provoke them to ask us for the reason for the hope that we have in us When everything you read says that we're living in this country, in this economy, on a bubble that's going to burst and it's going to burst hard. When race riots are beginning to grow up, when there's a hatred for authority so that it seems like now hardly anyone hesitates if they have a gun. They, hes they hardly ever hesitate. It's understood that you would do that. We have leaders at the highest places who are, who are race baiters, who have something to gain by dividing the people. How do we live in the midst of that? With joy. And they can't take our joy. They can't. Joy is one of those properties that when you're given it by the Lord, the only way you don't have it is if you give it up, if you give it away. If you, if you say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to... I'm going to hide it under a bushel. I, I'm not going to show that. I'm not going to smile. They can't take our joy. We're the ones who just, we, we have to surrender it somehow. But if we're pur purposing not to give it up, if we're purposing not to surrender, it will be purpose to give it away, then it multiplies in the hearts and lives of people we touch who have no joy. You've seen them. They've just come through Christmas. They just opened presents a couple of days ago and already some are very sad and discontent and downcast. But we, see our joy is not in presents, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E our joy is in P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, presents. His presence. Let's pray.